Uh, you want to talk about legends. Is that the conversation you want to have? Tom Hartman joins us on the Young Turks. <laughs> All right. Tom Hartman. Hey, I'm so pleased to be on with the legendary Jen Kuger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Tom, you've written, uh, what, what is it, 36 or 48 books in your life? I, I, I've probably written somewhere between 30 and 40 books, but I have 21 in print right now. <laughs> okay, 21 in print right now. Uh, but we want to talk to you. Of course, Tom Hartman is a uh, syndicated uh, radio host throughout the country. Uh, we want to talk to him about one of his books, but actually, first, h- how many stations are you on, Tom? Uh, you know, I'm I'm not really sure, Jack. It's uh, is it, is we're, it, we're, is it 128 to 248, it's, or it's, it's it's over 100 and, and and probably fewer than 140. I, we we just added five last week. Uh, we, we're syndicated by three different networks: um, uh, Dow Global, Pacifica, and uh, Free Speech TV, and so if you're talking radio stations, it's it's between 100 and 140, and and then we're on probably 30 or 40 TV stations. I'm not, I, I, I don't keep track of it in my head. It's all over on our website, though. You can count them up. All right. That's awesome. Uh, you know, everybody knows Tom used to work at Air America and uh, is, uh, is as good a progressive radio host as there is in the country. And uh, you've got a couple of fans here, uh, let alone me. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank but, you. Uh, they're always, did I'm you know honored. what Tom Hartman said? They're trying to keep me, you know, informed. All right, so, uh, Tom, your book... Well, I'm a Young Turks fan as well, and, and very often Louise and I are watching your videos going, oh, that's a good one, you know. In fact, uh, you know, we've, we've, you and I have had some uh, kind of cross-talking where we've talked about each other on the air. Uh, but in any case, yep. uh, moving forward. All right, now, uh, you've got the new edition of Unequal Protection out, and I, and I think that's very relevant to what's happening today. So, first, tell yep. everybody, what is Unequal Protection about? Well, the, the title derives from the 14th Amendment, which was passed along with the 13th and the 15th Amendments uh, by the Radical Republicans, they called themselves, at the, after the Civil War in the, in the 1870s in Reconstruction, to free the slaves. And uh, the first uh, article of the 14th Amendment says, and I, this is me paraphrasing from memory but and, and condensing somewhat, but basically it says that that uh, anybody who's born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen, and that uh, all... That, that no person shall be denied the uh, equal protection, well, shall be denied equal protection under the law. And that is both its blessing and its fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw is that the 14th Amendment says no person shall be denied equal protection under the law. And historically, and by historically I mean like going back to 10th century England, uh, co- British common law, there have always been two kinds of persons. There's been natural persons, human beings, you and me, and there have been artificial persons, which are corporations, governments, and churches, uh, and unions, uh, which have to have some sort of status as persons in order to sue and be sued, own land, pay taxes, enter into contracts, but they're not human beings. And because the 14th Amendment didn't put the word natural before the word person, Starting in the 1880s, the railroads, which were the Microsofts of their day, the biggest corporations in the world, started claiming that the, the writers, the authors of the 14th Amendment, actually meant for it to include corporations in its purview. And that whole argument reached its zenith in January of this year when five right-wing idiots on the Supreme Court claimed that, yes, indeed, corporations are persons, and not only that, they have access to First Amendment rights. Now, they've already claimed Fourth Amendment rights of privacy, Fifth Amendment rights against taking and self-incrimination. They've used these to hide tobacco and asbestos, for example, for over a half a decade, the dangers, or a half a century, or other. And 14th Amendment privileges, the 14th Amendment itself, where uh, organizations like Walmart and, and uh, hog farms claim that keeping them out of your neighborhood is the same as saying to a black person they can't eat at the lunch counter with a white person. All right, now we're going to get into why that's so important and how it's dominating our politics in a second. Well, let's go back here. First, let's start all the way back to the 10th century. So, the, technically, the word persons was used in both contexts. So That's correct. It has been ever since the beginning of British common law. It's really okay. the 6th century, uh, if, you, if you want to get super technical about it. Okay, and, and so what happened in that railroad case that, that, you know, that was a, a pivotal turning point? 
Well, this was uh, this was a really interesting one. I'll, uh, when I sat down to write this book, I was writing and kind of an arc of the the history of modern corporate power. And all the books that I read, David Corton's When Corporations Rule the World, and and even the the, the 1930s uh, history by Charles and Mary Beard, which was probably the most famous history of America, short of of uh, uh, Howard Zinn, and even Howard Zinn for that matter. Everybody said that in 1886. The Supreme Court, in a, in a case called Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, that the Supreme Court ruled that corporations actually were persons under the Fourteenth Amendment. And so I was living, as I was writing the book, I was trying to primary source everything. I had this twenty-volume collected writings of Jefferson, and I was, you know, yeah, I was, I was, I didn't want to quote anybody. I wanted everything to be primary source. So I went down to the to the Supreme Court Library in Montpelier, Vermont, where I lived, this capital city, and I said to Paul Donovan, the head librarian there, I'd like to see a copy. Uh, I'd like to see the original 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case. And he said, oh, you mean the one where corporations became persons or people? And I said, yeah. And so he goes down the stacks and pulls out this old, dusty, leather-bound book that was literally published in 1889, and by Banks and Biddle in New York, and opens it up and finds the case. He says, here's the head note. We can skip that. That doesn't have any legal status. Here's the case. It begins right here, and it runs about 18 pages. And I sat down and read the whole thing all the way through, and there wasn't a single word in there that said the corporations are persons. In fact, it said the opposite. At the very end, it said several constitutional issues were brought before the court, but because we were able to find remedy in the law of the state of California, we felt no need to address those constitutional issues. So I went back to Paul and I said, uh, you know, who's both a, a, law, a lawyer and a librarian, being the head librarian for the Supreme Court. And I said, you know, what's, what's the deal here? And he said, no, it's got to be in there. I learned that in law school. And he's thumbing through it, and he reads all the way to the end, and he goes, whoa, that's really weird. And he says, let's read the head note. Let's see what the head note says. Maybe it'll give us some clue. And there in the second or third paragraph of the head note, it says, corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment and entitled to equal protection under the law. And he's looking at this with this weird look on his face. He says, what does it mean? And he said, well, it looks to me like the head note contradicts the decision. Like, you know, this head note's just like out of space. And I said, does it have any legal status? And he said, no. In fact, there was a 1908 or uh, uh, 1909 Supreme Court decision that explicitly ruled that head notes have no legal standing. And that was the beginning of a check. So, okay, that's incredibly fascinating because we've been going on this assumption for all this time that corporations are persons and then they get to spend money and buy our politicians etc based on a mistake that uh, you literally uncovered uh, well and not just we, not just we let me let me just uh, if i may embellish this a little because this is an amazing story there was a case there was a case in the 1980s called first national bank versus Bilotti, where the first uh, massachusetts had this law that said that corporations could only contribute money to political campaigns if the campaign affected them. In other words, a bank could could put money into a, a ballot initiative that had to do with banking, but not that it had to do with gay marriage, right? Mm -hmm. And and the bank had contributed money to a campaign and to a ballot initiative that had nothing to do with banking. They got sued by by Frank Bellotti, who was the the attorney general. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the and the and the and the and the. Uh, corporation, the First National Bank of Boston, was claiming that they had a First Amendment right of free speech because of this 1886 case. In the dissent, now it was a five to four decision, as I recall, and the, the bank won. Um, in the dissent was Rehnquist, the chief, the very conservative chief justice, and it's an amazing dissent to read. I recommend you look it up. The dissent in Boston versus Bloody. In that dissent, he says, and I'm paraphrasing from memory, but this is awful damn close, Back in 1886, this court, without the benefit of public dialogue, discourse, or debate, ruled unilaterally that corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment. In my opinion, this was a wrongly decided case, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, and this was our opportunity. And then, you know, I don't remember, you know, and then in long legalese, he basically says this was our opportunity to overturn it, and we blew it. Rehnquist didn't even know that, the, that it was in the head note and not in the case. Rehnquist! The Chief Justice. And Tom, you Pardon know my ranting. <laughs> I, I did my independent research on this uh, a couple of months ago, and I'm way late to it compared to you. Uh, and I ran across Bellotti, and I was like, I don't know why people don't talk about this. This is the pivotal case that says uh, that the corporations are not only people, but they can spend money on our campaigns under the First Amendment. That's and that right. Changes, and and and, and, that and changes, Rehnquist was opposed to it. No, and here's the amazing part. That first of all, that changes everything. From then yep. on, because I had 
run into Ralph Nader a couple times. He'd been on the show, then I'd run into him in some other things. And I kept asking him, what changed? Because Ralph Nader's killing people in the 70s, and he's getting seatbelts on the cars and OSHA and, he, yep. and et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, the Democratic Party switches on a dime. And he said, it's this guy named Tony uh, Coelho. And uh, he started, he got this genius idea, hey, why don't we take corporate money like the Republicans are? But the thing is, when I, so based on that, I started my research, and that led me to this Bilotti decision, because that's when they can start taking money from corporations. Yep. And so that's what changes the whole ballgame. So everybody always thinks, oh, no, no, corporate America has always controlled our politicians. In some ways, that's true, and they found ways of giving them money and privilege and position, et cetera, in other ways. But in a lot of ways, it's not true, that it actually started with that case, the wholesale takeover of our system. And At least in the modern era, from, from the 1880s until 1907, corporations were basically buying politicians left and right. And then Teddy Roosevelt got the Tillman Act passed in 1907, which was just overturned by this case, by Citizens United. And the Tillman Act made it a felony to give money to federal candidates. Mm-hmm. And Pardon my interrupting. No, no, no. Yeah, that's, I, that's why we brought you on. I, I love that context. And by the way, one other additional piece of context here. Um, the guy who was in the majority in the Bellotti decision was John Paul Stevens. And, yeah. and, and Stevens just gave a speech saying, hey, when I started out, I was the conservative, right? I was appointed yeah. to be a conservative by a Republican. And he said, I didn't change at all. And now I'm retiring, and I'm the most liberal justice out of any of these guys. Yep. And so it's, it's amazing how much things have changed. Partly because Although he wrote a blistering dissent in Citizens United, that you read that dissent and you would never think that he was he was one of the lead authors of uh, Bellotti. Yeah, and, and and it's amazing how things have changed. I uh, flipped on his head, but I want to go back to 1886 for one more quick second here. So, who wrote that head note, Tom? The one that the guy who wrote the head note, right? The guy who wrote the head note was the clerk of the court back then. You have to understand back then, the clerk of the court was in D.C. 12 months out of the year and was paid. $12,500 a year. The individual Supreme Court justices were only in Washington, D.C. three months out of the year and only were paid $10,000 a year. And the other nine months of the year, they did what was called riding the circuit. They were out, you know, in uh, Stephen J. Field, for example, was the Ninth Circuit, so he was out in San Francisco. And, you know, the, uh, the Chief Justice was in D.C. because that's the First Circuit. But the, the other nine circuits, they, they were, they were they were the local, what we now call the courts of appeals, the, just, the, you know, the, the circuit courts. And so they, the justices did dual duty. So he, the guy who wrote the head note, two years, by the way, after the chief justice died, because he says he's quoting the chief justice in the head note. The guy who wrote the head note is, it was the, the clerk of the court, John Chandler Bancroft Davis. He was the son of the former governor of Massachusetts, very wealthy and aristocratic family, and his previous job before becoming clerk of the court, which, as I said, was a really more powerful position than any of the justices, was to be the president of the Baltimore and uh, New York Railroad. So he was the head of the railroads. And did you say he wrote the head note two years after the case? That's right. So... <laughs> So the whole thing's a fraud. That's right. And in fact, it, it not only is it a fraud, it's a conspiracy. Uh, we found in the Library of Congress correspondence between Stephen J. Field, who was the, the Ninth Circuit, he was the California justice, and also he was on the Supreme Court. Um, and he sent, this, Santa Clara County was one of seven, as I recall, cases they're referred to as the California tax cases that from, from the uh, late 1870s to the late 1880s kept being thrown to the Supreme Court. And the first couple of them were like dismissed with ridicule. I, I cite this in my book. And we found letters from Field that I don't think anybody had opened in a hundred years to Field from like uh, Jay Gould, you know, like the, the, the railroad barons telling them telling him that if he would help them get corporate personhood status, they would sponsor him for President of the United States in the election of 18-whatever-it-was, 1888 or 1890. I guess it would have been 1888. And he did. Well, and, and that's how it works. So now, Tom, come back to Bologna for just a second here. We're talking to Tom Hartman, nationally syndicated radio host. Uh, also on YouTube, you could find clips of his uh, on his channel, and then the author of Unequal Protection, what we're discussing here. Uh, are you, do you agree with me uh, that Bellotti is, the, is a massive turning point, or am I seeing that a little wrong, or are there other cases that are more important? 
Well, you know, Bellotti and Buckley versus Vallejo, yeah, those those were significant ones. I'd say the other massive turning point, though, Jenk, was the death of the unions. You know, it was uh, when Ronald Reagan came into office in 1980, 25% of the labor force was unionized. And the unions had a lot of money, and they were a reliable source of cash for the Democratic Party. When Bill Clinton was running for 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 the presidency in 1992, by that time, Reagan had had just killed the, the unions. I mean, it's 7% of the private workforce now. At that time, it was around 11%. It had been cut in half. And so he couldn't get the money that he needed to run for president. And that was why Bill Clinton created the New Democrats, is what they were referred to at the time, and the Democratic Leadership Committee, the DLC, and basically said, you know, we'll get in bed with the corporations, overtly and proudly. And and created this huge schism within the Democratic Party. It wasn't until the Obama campaign, grassroots, because of the the advent of the internet, that the Democratic Party was able to raise money for a major national campaign without all that union money that no longer existed, and without going for corporate money. So that's I mean, there's also kind of a sociological background of this that had to do with the success of the Reagan Revolution and Reagan's war on organized labor. And so we got Obama elected without uh, that without as much corporate money and without as much union money and how'd that work out for us well you know we'll see i'm i'm <laughs> i'm unhappy obviously but uh, the thing that we have to keep in mind and this case makes it really clear jack is that the most powerful branch of government is the supreme court the supreme court literally tomorrow could say you know in our ter- interpretation of the general welfare clause in the constitution health care is a right not a privilege and boom you would have national health care in the united states the next day the Supreme Court could say, you know, our interpretation of the Contracts Clause of the Constitution uh, makes it says that it's illegal for us to have minimum wage laws, unemployment insurance, uh, child labor laws, maximum wage hour laws, any of those things. And in fact, they ruled that way in a series of cases back in the 19 teens. And you could, it would totally change the face of America. They took this power out of themselves in 1803 in a case called Marbury versus Madison. It's not given to them in the Constitution. They've been exercising it ever since 1803. Jefferson was president at the time, and when this case was decided, Marbury versus Madison, he said, "If this, he said, this makes the Constitution a suicide pact, and if this stands, it has become a thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, and this is the beginning of the corruption of the of America." So, because the Supreme Court is the most important, the most powerful of the three branches. It's really important that we have a Democrat in the White House, particularly when conservative justices die or decide to retire, even if it's a lousy Democrat, because the Supreme Court is where all the power really is. And so I'm willing to cut Obama a million passes as long as he's president and he appoints Supreme Court justices. Uh, I'm, not sure. make sense? Uh, I'm not sure I'm willing to cut him as many passes, but just real quick, final question for you. Uh, yeah. Ilana Kagan, are you convinced she's on our side on this issue, or or not necessarily? Yeah. No, I'm I'm convinced that she's on our side. All all of her political background, um, which she enthusiastically volunteered for and jumped into, and and even her parents' background uh, tells me that she's a she's a progressive or at least a liberal. All right, let's see how she votes on those uh, you know uh, corporate decisions, which are the most important. Uh, yeah, they are. All right, Tom Hartman, everybody check him out uh, on the radio, on YouTube, and his book, of course, is Unequal Protection. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Jack. It's been an honor.